Well, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, to speak about uh, some of the uh, what you're saying about the economic issues uh, in this report on global governance, um, uh, and, uh, and in, in taking into account the uh, the major uh, issues that we identify uh, in the global uh, governance system. The the first one is the uh, the fact that the uh, the system is not uh, well equipped to manage interdependence. Uh, the second, the, uh, the inequities uh, associated uh, uh, both to participation in decision making, but also in the, in the results, the outcomes of the functioning of the system. Uh, and, the, and the very important issue uh, for developing countries of the policy space uh, they have. And let me refer to some of, the, of these issues in uh, in relation to, uh, to our report. I mean, in terms of interdependence, uh, uh, you can say that uh, we, uh, you know, we identify areas of uh, in which, uh, uh, you know, there is something in place, uh, not necessarily the optimal, uh, uh, and, and in fact, there has been advance in some areas, um, uh, and not in others, let's say. Uh, uh, in, the, in the positive sense, uh, we, we say, well, in, in the area of financial regulation, uh, there has been a significant advance uh, in recent years uh, under the leadership of the G20 and the Financial Stability Board. Uh, there was also the, uh, in, in trade, the, uh, they say, well, first of all, we have an international institution uh, in place uh, for uh, a relatively long time. Uh, uh, after you know the painful process uh, of negotiations, there was a, a breakthrough. Let's say uh, in Bali. Uh, there are probably uh, other advantages of WTO that we don't quite uh, underscore frequently. For example, uh, the fact that uh, during this uh, recent crisis there was a, not a, a broad-based return to protectionism, which was so harmful uh, during the Great Depression of the 1930s, is also one of the advantages of WTO and WTO. It also has a dispute settlement mechanism that is not widely used by, by low-income countries, uh, but it, it is uh, some of the best uh, we have in the international system. But at the same time, for example, in the area of trade, uh, we have the uh, multiplication of bilateral agreements uh, so that the system uh, uh, is increasingly coherent. So it doesn't meet the, the criteria of, of coherence uh, of the system. So, you know, uh, and in, and in many ways, the bilateral agreements, uh, uh, come back to them, uh, 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 turn out to be more, uh, 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 constrain more the policy space uh, than some the WTO itself. In other areas, we, we don't have much advance. Uh, uh, well, we, we underscore, and we're going to underscore to, to ECOSOC in particular, uh, the issue of taxation, uh, in which essentially there is uh, a uh, there is nothing uh, in place uh, that is uh, of any significance for the OECD, uh, you know, agreement, uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and it's pushing, uh, in, in, let's say, in some direction that uh, may be uh, 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 useful in the long term, but, you know, so far, uh, it's not much. And I'm going to discuss that point in, in, a, in, a, in a second. And also in the macroeconomic area, as opposed to the finance area, uh, there, there is uh, a also uh, limited advance. Uh, uh, basically, uh, during this crisis, uh, we put an immense apparatus uh, in place, uh, you know, uh, to the G20, but also to the IMF, uh, to try to do uh, a strong surveillance of, of macroeconomic policies. Uh, and the, the uh, essential issue is that, you know, somehow the, uh, there, there will be more coherence in the macroeconomic policies. Uh, and in fact, you know, uh, you know, this has not happened. Uh, uh, the, uh, the major manifestation, I mean, major new imbalance in the global economy uh, is the rising surplus of the European Union. Uh, and the rising surplus of, of the European Union is pressuring uh, actually developing countries uh, to uh, run deficits. Uh, and that is a major, uh, uh, you know, imbalance which is extremely harmful for the uh, developing countries. You can say that other parts uh, have moved in a better uh, direction. Uh, so the whole apparatus of macroeconomic cooperation, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, both in the G20 and the IMF, uh, have so far failed uh, to, uh, you know, to correct uh, those uh, growing imbalances. Uh, uh. 
Now, in terms of uh, of a, a, uh, inequality, um, uh, as Diane already uh, pointed out, uh, one of the major issues that we want to underscore uh, are the implications uh, of a world in which we have a, a, a high mobility of capital, uh, but very limited mobility of labor. And if within, uh, uh, as you, said, uh, you can say in terms, a high mobility of skill labor and you know very limited and almost uh, in some cases nil mobility of uh, uh, of unskilled labor uh, and, and that generates uh, 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 you know effects uh, uh, on the uh, 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 on the distributive effects worldwide. Uh, so the uh, the rising trend uh, towards inequality in the world. Uh, which has come to be underscored uh, as a major issue, and, and we underscored that actually in our report to Ecosoft last year, and we're going to do again this year because that has to be a major item in our view in the post-2015 agenda. You know, the, the United Nations has to commit uh, to reducing uh, this rising, you know, this trend uh, in, 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 uh, in the inequality. Now, in, behind that, uh, a, there are at least two factors that we want to underscore in particular. Uh, the first one is taxation. Uh, the, the way the international system is functioning uh, is, uh, is, a, is uh, you know, by the mobi high mobility of, of capital, is actually reducing the contribution of capital income and capital gains uh, to the revenue base uh, of governments worldwide. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, has uh, major effects uh, uh, to start with because it, you know it means that the uh, uh, that the uh, you know the, the higher income part of the population in the world, uh, which are the owners of capital, uh, in, in the world in which wealth inequality is even worse distributed than income, uh, that means that you know they are not the you know they are benefiting from the from the this global implicit global rule. Uh, or, or this uh, functioning of global economy. Uh, so, uh, uh, but also because it reduces the revenue base uh, of every individual country in the world, uh, uh, which is essential to provide the, uh, the social services, uh, which give opportunity particularly to the, uh, uh, to the, the less uh, uh, or the more disadvantaged parts of the population. So we're going to underscore that you know, one major issue that the international community, led by the United Nations, should do is actually to move into, uh, into uh, how you know, attacking this major problem, uh, the, uh, the major problem generated by, by tax evasion, by tax, uh, 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 you know, by the effects, let's say, of the tax havens. Uh, and the tax havens, by the way, uh, are uh, everywhere, uh, including major advanced countries. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the movement in this direction uh, has been extremely limited and we think that the, uh, uh, somehow we, you, know, you can think of different avenues uh, or in which this issue can be discussed. I mean, to the start with, the, the ECOSOC has an expert committee of cooperation in tax matters. Uh, that, that the committee could be upgraded uh, in the structure of the United Nations system, for example, to an intergovernmental organ, uh, uh, you know, I, I myself proposed that in the past uh, uh, when I was uh, on the Secretary General uh, that uh, uh, we should have uh, in, the, you know, in this committee the heads of taxation of the world sitting down, you know, talking about, you know, to, the, you know, to each other you know, of how to improve the uh, and how to avoid uh, some of the uh, major problems of the world taxation system, and maybe the international community has to go to a convention. Uh, to attack taxation, uh, uh, avoidance of taxation and uh, tax evasion uh, by you know, really capital uh, in, uh, income and capital gains, which are the two major uh, and the most uh, uh, you know, the biased part of the income distribution uh, in the world. There are other issues that we underscore that, let me say, uh, in relation to the macroeconomic policy area, the, uh, uh, we also underscore the, the lack of, a, a, of any international a mechanism to manage uh, uh, over indebtedness of countries. Uh, uh, so this, uh, the absence of a debt workout mechanism uh, uh, is, it is usually uh, uh, discussed. This issue has come back into the agenda. It, it had uh, received some attention actually uh, in IMF discussions, and, and many other people are propo making proposals again 
or how to move uh, in that direction. And of course, there is there are groups of uh, uh, although in the past, you know, for example, the hiding that the two countries initiative uh, was a big step forward in reducing the debt burden uh, of, uh, of the, you know of poor countries. Uh, we have uh, actually a series of middle income countries, for example, which have a, a significant debt trap uh, without which uh, they cannot uh, you know, overcome the problem. And you can even say some tiny income countries that may be having exactly the same problem. So the, this is a serious issue that, uh, that uh, uh, and the, the major effect of this is that uh, you know, over indebted countries uh, end, end up in a situation in which uh, you know, they, they run the let's say, persistent austerity policies, uh, which uh, have extremely adverse uh, distributive effects on, on the population. <coughs> well, in the third dimension, uh, the, the, uh, the policy space, um, uh, let me uh, uh, start by, by underscoring uh, some of the problems that we, uh, uh, we uh, introduced in relation to analysis of the, of the trade system, uh, uh, which I I want to mention uh, two in particular. Uh, the first is the, uh, uh, say the growing irrelevance of a special and differential treatment uh, in the trade system, uh, which is, uh, you know, was a major uh, step forward, uh, let's say, back in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, in terms of uh, helping to uh, even out uh, or reduce the inequalities in the international economy. Uh, and which uh, today is particularly important uh, for the low-income countries in the world. Uh, it is quite it, it clear that, uh, that uh, the system is not functioning well in WTO itself, but is uh, essentially being uh, eliminated altogether in bilateral agreements of different sorts. Uh, and, uh, and to use the terminology that, uh, uh, of the, uh, the relevant chapter in our report, uh, you know, we, it, it, which also uh, moving from flexibility in the disciplines, which was the origin of the concept, to flexibility in the implementation, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, giving more time to adjust, uh, but not at the end uh, changing the, you know, the, uh, or compensating for the asymmetries of the international system uh, with a specific advantage for developing countries. And the second is the fact that the, uh, the, uh, the proliferation of bilateral agreements of different sort. Uh, the policy space uh, is being significantly constrained uh, in, uh, for developing countries, uh, in, uh, and, and this is uh, a remarkably uh, uh, so uh, uh, in relation to, to you know the, the uh, policy space that countries uh, should be able to have to uh, advance in one of the areas in which I, I see most consensus in relation to the post 2015 discussion which is the issue of industrialization of developing countries. Uh, uh, so they, uh, you know, without an adequate policy space to, other, you know, adopt the policies necessary for that, uh, this uh, objective that I hope, the, again, the, uh, the United Nations will adopt as part of the post-2015 agenda, uh, you know, is unlikely to, uh, to have a success. Uh, and, the, and the last issue in relation to policies, or the second issue I wanted to underscore uh, relates to the uh, uh, to the management of the uh, extreme volatility in, in capital flows uh, that developing countries have, uh, which uh, is again back in the agenda, uh, has been uh, you know with the uh, you know the announcement. Where, well, we, we just went through a boom in uh, financing uh, toward developing countries generated by uh, uh, by the uh, by policies of the central banks of the advanced countries. We generated, uh, you know, this uh, tsunami of capital, as the president of Brazil called it at one point, uh, and uh, and then uh, suddenly we are back in the desert, uh, uh, so that the uh, financing is uh, is falling significantly, and the management of these boom cycles in external, you know, in finance, uh, is a major issue that uh, in which we have had some advance, uh, but a very uh, limited one. Uh, and uh, in, in our view, uh, the, uh, this issue has not been adequately uh, addressed. Uh, for example, in, in, the, in the discussions on financial regulation in the Financial Stability Board, there is absolutely no reference to capital account volatility as a financial risk, uh, uh, which is surprising uh, in, you know, in, in a sense, because there are many other risks that are being well addressed by the Financial Stability Board, not this. The IMF took this issue to discussion uh, and came out to 
but the 2012 called the institutional view, uh, which is more favorable uh, to the uh, you know to the use of capital account regulation, capital account management, uh, particularly by emerging and developing countries, to uh, to be able to manage this volatility. But at the same time, it underscores one point, and, and this would be my last remark. Uh, which is that uh, there has been coherence in the international system. So if the IMF, uh, for example, the com uh, as, as an institution with all its members, agrees that you know that management of capital flows uh, is, a, is, a, is useful under many circumstances for uh, emerging and developing countries, uh, the trade agreements and the investment agreements uh, should do the same. And it just happened that the investment agreements are a significant constraint. Uh, for the uh, for uh, developing countries to adopt these policies, so uh, you know uh, you may be allowed by the IMF to do you know some management of capital flows, uh, but some of the free trade agreements would uh, forbid it. Uh, you know, actually, by by definition, uh, in the investment agreements, uh, that the uh, that you know that financial flows are one form of uh, of uh, investment that has to be fully protected. So the the uh, recipient countries can, can adopt no policy. Uh, that will somehow uh, constrain uh, the, uh, the, the full mobility of that country. Uh, so the, the coherence is again uh, back in, into this topic, in the sense that the uh, in the sense that trade and investment agreements have been more have to be more consistent with what the IMF institutional view uh, that has been adopted in 2012. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jose Antonio. Uh, Let me say that uh, on the question of the role of the private sector, uh, first of all, that there are uh, many private actors uh, in development. Uh, the, the business sector is one, but the, there are also civil society organizations, uh, uh, you know, different character, uh, philanthropic organizations. Uh, I guess I, I, I am part of that world because I'm academian. Uh, so, uh, so there is a, it's a, a very broad world. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, I, I like participation of all those actors in the development process. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, I mean, the idea of multi-stakeholder processes, uh, I, I think is, uh, is part of the agenda. However, that, not, that should not be understood as replacing the essential role that the intergovernmental uh, uh, agenda has. So uh, if, if I may say one, a particular issue, I have been uh, very critical of the high-level panel report on the post-2015 agenda, it was to try to present the Global Partnership for Development as a multi-stakeholder partnership. No, that's multi-stakeholder partnerships are, uh, are instruments, uh, but the intergovernmental, I mean, the Global Partnership for Development has to be, at the essence, an intergovernmental agenda. Uh, and, and I think this is, I think we said that in our report, uh, uh, you know, in very clear terms. Um, it, it, and in the case of the private sector, uh, or the business sector, let's say, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, when uh, when they become, I mean, there is, the business sector comes as, a, as an investor, you know, and, and, and of course, uh, there are domestic business sector and multinationals, let's say, uh, active in, uh, or and now the multi-national uh, uh, from developing countries, you know, active in many places of the world. Uh, but the, um, uh, so in that regard, you know, their business sector, I think the, uh, for example, corporate social responsibility uh, should be part of their agenda. And, and I think this, you know, we can have uh, many sense. And, and as I always say, uh, when I talk about corporate social responsibility, it's something very similar to what Diane just said, you know, the, the first principle of corporate social responsibility is pay taxes. Okay? Uh, pay, <laughs> pay your taxes. That's the very first principle of corporate social responsibility. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this additional point, uh, which I think is a very important emerging issue, is when the, the Business sector is used as an instrument of, of development cooperation, and I, I think in that regard they have to be equally responsible and equally accountable uh, to the uh, uh, to the authorities of recipient countries 
uh, under the principle of the ownership of uh, development policies by by countries. Uh, so uh, uh, we should not try to to say that because they are uh, agents, they, they have somehow different uh, uh, rules uh, that they operate to the, to those of, of uh, governmental intergovernmental cooperation. Um, uh, on the issue of the, the UN uh, Bretton Woods, uh, uh, let me say that uh, when I teach, uh, since I teach a course of global economic governance, you know, when I come to the UN, I actually copy the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the organic gram of the United Nations that you see in the UN website. So that I put to myself, this is the United Nations system. And I always see there the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are a specialized agencies of the United Nations system. And this should be a clear forever. I mean, there should be no doubt about that. And I think the, if there is any doubt, the, you know, it should be clarified. I actually also say that the, the, the one, uh, inter and, and that's clearly recognized in many ways. For example, they are members of the Chief Executive Board of the UN system. And they, they attend regularly, they participate. Uh, there are many other ways in which they, uh, you know, participate in, uh, in the UN process, it, but there should be no question mark uh, about this. Now, uh, uh, the one that is not part of the UN system is WTO, and in my uh, view, uh, it should be incorporated into the UN system. I think that's a, a step that has to be taken, uh, you know, sooner than later. Uh, finally, on the issue of the MDGs uh, and the development agenda. Uh, you know, let me say on, on this, uh, on the post-2015 and the development agenda, let me say that I, I have always been of the view that the development agenda of the United Nations is much broader than the MDGs. Uh, so there is a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, to start with the conventions, uh, the conventions are actually in a broader sense because the conventions of human rights, but it's the ILO conventions, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, which are equally important from the point of view of social development. Uh, but there are also the, uh, the, the uh, outcomes of the major uh, summits and conferences of the United Nations. Uh, and I, I don't think the MDGs or the, post or the items in the uh, objectives in the post-2015 agenda uh, will ever replace that broader agenda. Uh, and, um, and that broader agenda, for example, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certain, well, in the MDGs and the post-2015 agenda, there will be gender goals, okay? But they, that would never replace uh, the outcomes of the, particularly the, of Beijing, uh, in terms of the gender agenda of the United Nations. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and that is true of many. So, so I, I understand the MDGs as a particular, uh, I, you know, subset of priority objectives of the, of the international community and the UN, you know, through the UN system. And I understand the post 2015 that has to be something like that. You know, some, you know, these are the priority areas in which we are going to concentrate. But you should never forget about the broader agenda. That's why in the accountability mechanism that we put in place, we should not forget about the rest of the agenda. And, and the rest of the agenda has accountability mechanisms in some cases. For example, the, the, the committees of the, uh, the follow-up of the, uh, you know, the, the human rights conventions uh, are an instrument of accountability. Uh, and uh, you can say that the, the, the functional commissions of ECOSOC should be accountability mechanisms for the specific agenda. So the, you know, the, 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 uh, the follow-up of the, of the Beijing platform of action should continue to be one of the major uh, you know, activities uh, of the Commission on the Status of Women. And, uh, and, and, uh, and you can say that on, uh, on the different uh, summits and conferences of the United Nations system. So we have to have this, uh, we have to conceive the accountability uh, 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 in, a, in, a, you know, in those broad sense uh, of the term to include all the elements of the of the UN development agenda and don't try. I think one of the major mistakes that was made uh, sometimes in relation to the MDGs is to say that this is the development agenda. No, that's one part. That's a priority, some sort of priority areas uh, of the of, uh, of, UN, of UN of the UN system, but they don't replace the broader agenda.